Good morning. Do we have sound? Got video? We're set to go. All right. Now, this morning for announcements, uh, we do have uh, VBS coming up here, the 25th through the 29th, 9th, Monday through Friday. Uh, if you'd like to help out, uh, see Todd, I guess it would be, and uh, we'll, we'll include you in the program somehow, I'm sure. Everybody's welcome. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Need. Okay. So we need cookies, cookies, and more cookies, and lots of cookies. There we go. Okay. Um, we have a board meeting coming up here this uh, uh, tomorrow and women's prayer group on Wednesday. Okay, board meeting tomorrow at seven. Okay, anything I've missed? We do have some new ad addresses, we have Claire's address and one other I know on the board back here. So if you'd like to see addresses for those folks that have, have moved to different locations, uh, they're back here on the board, okay? Anything else? Don't see any hands. Okay, let's stand for our uh, call to worship. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Okay, Psalm 72. Okay, let's stay standing for our first song and then we'll sit down. seated. Our communion hymn is uh, My Tribute.
with the blood he has saved us. Hmm. We talk a lot about uh, the blood of Christ and and uh, the many things that uh, that we've learned through the years. How we process this blood, life giving substance in in our society, because there's no replacement for it. So as we look at uh, the blood of Christ that covers us and forgives us and all these different avenues, we also can look at some things that the blood is not. The blood of Christ does not cover your sins. The blood of Christ does not conceal your sins. The blood of Christ does not postpone your sins. The blood of Christ does not diminish your sins. John talks about it in, uh, in, the, in, his, uh, uh, in the book of John, <clears throat> uh, verse 29, uh, when Jesus, the next day when Jesus was coming to him, that is John the Baptist, he said to him, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away your sins takes away your sins and not just for today tomorrow but forever and so the precious precious blood of Christ covers in many different ways many different avenues but it takes away the sins once and for all so we have the communion and we have the, the, the bread that represents his body in that uh, we partake every Sunday and that's one thing we would like to do right now is to take the bread, uh, the body of Christ, that we can uh, be nourished through uh, through this bread for the week. We might uh, be able to remember to honor him in uh, the things that we do. Shall we do that at this time? And then likewise also, the cup, which represents his shared blood, is to take. And then we look, look at another scripture that said, Behold, Jesus said, Never has there been another man born of a woman as John the Baptist. And so we look at John as being the carrier, the opening carrier for Christ to come. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful that you give us the opportunity to gather around your table. We're thankful, Father, for the preciousness of your son's blood. We ask for a blessing this week that we might be able to regain uh, a a good rapport with uh, our neighbors, with uh, those that we uh, are in contact with this week, that we might honor you with our lives, and that we might uh, take you with us as we leave this place. Thank you for the many opportunities that lay before us this week, and we ask for your blessings on them. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, well, we're going to sing Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Uh, youngsters, you can go to your Sunday school at this point.
18 years ago down in Texas, I spent six days on jury duty, most of that time as a juror in a child custody case. The father of a 12-year-old boy was seeking primary custody of his son from the boy's mother. Now, this is going to be a kind of a long story, but I have a point, a reason for doing so. And so please listen, and I hope it'll be interesting to you. It was quite an eye-opening experience for me. And I want to tell you about it. The mother, 31 years old, had five children by four different men and was never married to any of them. She and her children had moved often, living with different men each time. At times, the children had been parceled out to live with her mother, who had three children of her own without benefit of marriage, or with her sister, who had two children and had never been married either. This young mother had been arrested frequently for public intoxication and had disappeared for days at a time, leaving her children behind. She'd often been fined for public intoxication and for traffic violations, but had never paid any of her fines. So there were outstanding arrest warrants with her name on them. Now, even though some of these warrants were five years old, she had never been served, possibly because then the court would have the responsibility of taking care of her five children. And the mother knew it. Shortly after the boy in question was born, the boy's father had moved away and straightened out his life. He started attending church, began a business, developed a good reputation, and gotten married. He acknowledged his responsibility for the boy for years and had regularly provided child support. As a result, for most of the boy's life, the father had been allowed to custody of the boy each summer. But when the boy was 10 years old, the mother told the father that he, she would never let him see the boy again. So he began a child custody lawsuit. Meanwhile, the mother and her five children and her sister with her two children were living together in a welfare-provided uh, housing. A few months before this trial, a man had moved in with her, and a couple of weeks before this trial started, they got married. Five days later after their marriage, both of them were arrested for selling cocaine. And it wasn't for the first time either. A month before that, he had been arrested on exactly the same charge. Now he was in jail again. But the authorities dismissed the charges against her so she could take care of her children. Of course, now I'm skipping some of the sordid details, but you've heard enough to get the idea, haven't you? So when the case was turned over to the jury, I assumed that it would take just one vote to give the boy to his father. But boy, was I wrong. The first vote 
was nine to three in favor of the mother. Well, as we discussed it the rest of the day, I was amazed that more than half of the jury saw nothing wrong with the mother's lifestyle. The large number of men she had been involved with, a lot more than just the men who had fathered her children, and her many arrests for public intoxication. After all, I like to party on weekends too, said one of the jurors. Another juror, a social worker, said, there's nothing wrong with her. That's the way everybody lives today. Only one juror on her side expressed concern at all about the drug dealing and the items seized by the agent, drug agents. Here they were, living on welfare and in their welfare provided housing, they had four expensive TVs, four top of the line VCRs, three camcorders, numerous cameras, gold jewelry, and lots of cash, and many other costly appliances, some of them just back in the closet. One juror said, after all, we don't know that these items were bought with drug money. Maybe she just saved money from her welfare checks to buy all of them. Anyway, the juror said, there's no evidence the boy has been harmed. He makes average grades in school, so the way she lives hasn't affected him. Now, I'm sitting through all this and taking part in the discussion. And yet the school report cards showed that seven of his last 10 teachers in elementary school marked him unsatisfactory in conduct, in his attitudes and actions. Now the jury foreman was an assistant principal and he and the social worker were the most vocal in saying that the mother's lifestyle has no effect on the boy. He also said, now this is the assistant principal, said the boy's unsatisfactory marks in conduct were probably the result of poor teachers rather than anything the boy did. Besides, he said, we had lots of drugs in our house when I was growing up, and I don't see anything wrong with that. Well, their primary argument, though, was that taking the boy away from his mother and turning him over to his father might harm the boy emotionally. They argued that they didn't want to witness the terrible scene when the verdict was read and we, did, and we gave the child to his father. Here's what they said. It would be chaos with the mother and child screaming and crying together as he is torn away from her there in the courtroom, they said. Now, of course, those of us who voted for the father also expressed our views. Now, by the way, none of them knew I was a preacher, but they knew I was a Christian. And I pled that the boy be given a chance to be exposed to a more normal home environment during his crucial teen years. He needs better role models 
than what he has been getting, we argued. Well, during the next few hours of that day, we voted again and again. And when it came time for the court to be closed for the day, we were deadlocked, six to six. Well, I went home that evening, sick at heart, afraid that it was going to be a hung jury. From what had been said, it seemed unlikely that anyone would change their vote. There were at least three of us who believed that to decide for the mother would virtually doom the boy to a dysfunctional, drug-ridden family and home life. And although I didn't say it out loud, there was no way I could vote my approval of her lifestyle and send him back into such a, well, a godless environment. Now sleep evaded me most of that night. I prayed some, and then I stayed up until the wee hours of the morning, carefully organizing thoughts that I hoped might help some of the jurors reconsider their attitude. Well, the next morning after, we met back in the jury room, and I sat there ready to discuss what had occupied my mind so much of the time that night before. But before anyone spoke, the foreman stated that during the night he had considered our plea to give the boy a chance and had decided to change his vote. And then three others said the same thing. Without any further discussion, we voted. And by a vote of 10 to 2, which was all that was necessary in a child custody case, we voted to make the father the primary custodian of the boy. Now, the interesting thing is this. In that courtroom, when the decision was announced, the mother just shrugged. And the boy didn't show any bad uh, reaction at all. Instead, he just leaned over and began talking with his father. Yes, there, there were tears in the courtroom, tears of joy by the father and by his parents. The only emotion from the mother was that shrug. One of the two jurors who had held out till the end for the mother because of his fear of the emotional trauma that we would see, expressed consternation afterwards. Maybe we did the right thing after all, he said. I think we did. Now, that's been a long story, but what is my point in telling you all this? Well, there are two points. First of all, what caused four of the jurors to change their vote. I mean, they'd been so adamant the evening the day before, we had spent almost seven hours discussing our voting in the jury room. And over and over again, they had made it quite clear that they weren't about to change their vote. Yet during the night, all four of them had come to the same conclusion for exactly the same reason. What happened? The only answer I can come up with is that the whole, God's Holy Spirit intervened and answered our prayers. All my sleepless worry and all my notes went for nothing because God stepped in and answered prayer. 
Now, God can do that. And I'm convinced he does so far more often than we ever realize. Now, secondly, as I said at the first of this sermon, it was an eye-opening experience for me. But really, I shouldn't have been. So this morning, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture in the Old Testament. And I want you to notice just how current, up-to-date, that passage is. It's a picture of a corrupted society that sounds very much like today. The obvious fact is that human nature hasn't changed much through the centuries, nor will it change unless it is touched by the gospel of Jesus. Now turn your attention with me to one of the few parables in the Old Testament. It is Isaiah, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 7. In a few seconds, you'll be seeing those passages on the screen. I want us to look at them. The first six verses are as following. I will sing for the one I love a song about the, his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it, cut out a wine press as well. And then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. That's the first six verses. And they tell of a vineyard planted in a fertile field. The field is fenced, the stone is removed, and it is planted with the finest vines. A protecting watchtower was built and a wine press set up. Altogether, a tremendous amount of time, labor, even of money, had been lavished on the vineyard. And after all this work was done, the owner expected a harvest of good grapes. And it disappoint, is disappointed when only bad fruit was produced. Now in verse 7, Isaiah explains the meaning of this parable. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Now, when Isaiah began his ministry, immorality had utterly destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel and had eaten like a cancer into the southern kingdom of Judah. The worship of God had sunk 
into obscurity. Heathen idol worship with its immoral ceremonies set up in its place. I mean, it was a time of moral degradation. Now, up to this time, God had always cared and protected the Jewish nation. In every national emergency, a way of escape, God had helped. A way of escape had been provided. When God led them out of Egypt, he sent Moses to show them the way and gave them his written law. When Moses was gone, God provided Joshua as their leader. And then when Joshua was gone, God provided 400 years of leadership through what today we call judges. Then, contrary to God's will, the people wanted a king. But not even then did God forsake them. No wonder Isaiah called Israel the well-cared-for vineyard of God. It isn't strange then to read that God exclaimed, what more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? In other words, after God had done everything possible to promote right living, right thinking, why will man persist in living on the level of animals or worse? Now, Israel is not the only nation that God has blessed. He guarded and guided them, and he was going to use them for a very special purpose. But other nations and peoples have been the object of God's care, too. And God must also have expected something from them. If, in God's sight, the receiving of his blessings calls for greater responsibility, then we in America must stand under heavy obligation. I believe that the God who showered his blessings and protection on Israel of old has done the same thing for us. Just study some of the things in history that occurred at the founding of our nation. It was almost impossible that we would have won the Revolutionary War or the War of 1812, except for certain things that happened. I think God has provided protection. But what does he see now? He now sees in our nation a standard of morality totally foreign to his will. There are bad grapes aplenty in the America vineyard. A generation ago, a drinker was held in disrespect. Now the one who will not drink is pictured as an oddball. A few years ago, the gambler was frowned upon. Now many cry out that gambling is the only way to save our states from financial collapse. Magazines, movies, TV glorify sexual relationships outside of marriage. They tell us we're only animals. 
And so many act like that. It's said that each generation sets its own moral standard. And the unchanging divine moral standard of Jesus is completely ignored. No wonder the God of the vineyard said, where are the good grapes? We need also to realize that the lesson of the parable of the vineyard does not just apply to Israel and America. The lesson applies to the church, too. Over and over, Jesus speaks of his kingdom, his church, as a vineyard. Do you realize that? Besides that, in 1 Corinthians 10th chapter, verse 6, Paul tells us what happened to Israel. That it was written down for our warning. Listen to his words. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. And Peter says of the church, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You know, God has great expectations of us. He's done all that he could do to produce the right kind of harvest. He gave Jesus heaven's best gift that his kingdom might come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He gave heaven's best guide, the Holy Spirit, and the world's most wonderful book, the Bible. Having, having done all this, he looks at his vineyard expectantly. He expects us to bear good fruit. Freely you have received, freely give, he tells us. He expects a different lifestyle from us than from the rest of the world. Come out from among them and be ye separate, he tells us. He expects an evangelized world. Surely he expects his command to go into all the world and preach the gospel, good news to all creation to be obeyed, or he would not have said it. Yes, the harvest that the master expects of his followers is written so clearly that anyone can see it. But the question comes, is God disappointed in the actual harvest? In place of the harvest he is looking for, he sees indifference and a harvest of bad grapes that must break his heart. In place of a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. He sees selfishness, envy, unforgiving spirits, and a general lack of dedication. In place of an evangelized world, the master, after nearly 2,000 years, looks upon a world in which millions still have not heard the good news about Jesus. And the sad thing is that many are not concerned about it. There's a famous Russian story. It's 100 years or so old. That tells of a lady who wept great tears 
in the theater over fictitious suffering while her coachman froze to death outside in the cold. Are we like that? Are we touched by a sermon and then walk out and quickly forget about the plight of our lost neighbors? The lesson in this parable not only applies to Israel and America and the church, it also applies to individuals. Our nation will be changed for the better only as individuals are changed. The church will be revived only as individuals are revived. Do you remember the parable of the lost sheep that Jesus told? It tells us that even one soul is precious in God's sight. Heaven gave its greatest gift, Jesus Christ, so that you and I might be saved. His cruel death upon the cross was endured so that you and I might live. So if you live a life without him, or worse, going to eternity without him, you do, you do so in spite of all that he has done for you. Most of, you, most of you, maybe all of you, have long realized the love of God, his care. And you've accepted Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. You followed his example in baptism. Now, by the Spirit of God, you're seeking to live as he would have you live. Well, we, we all make mistakes. We all stumble and fall. We're not perfect by any means. But we have a Lord who will lift us up, guide us, forgive us, till that day comes when we stand before him at that heavenly home. I'm looking forward, to, not right now, but I'm looking forward to that wonderful day Whenever it comes for me, how about you? We're going to sing our closing invitation here. <clears throat> it's an invitation that we make, make mean with all our heart. Will you answer his invitation? Will you accept him as your Savior and your Lord if you've not done so already? Or if you're already a Christian, we invite you to make this congregation your place of service. It's your decision. We're going to stand and sing. And if you have a decision to make, we invite you to come. Let's stand. When we walk with the
Please be seated for a time of prayer. This concludes today's worship service. Thank you for listening. We hope you were encouraged by joining us on Facebook Live. Please message us if you have questions or would like more information. May God bless you and give you his peace.